Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar this morning, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Um, not um, a cue to uh, analysis of um, the world of film, um, but uh, something entirely different, as they say. Uh, really pleased to have us with us, Dr. Andy Wells, and we'll come on to Andy in a minute. Um, I'd like, first of all, just to thank our sponsors um, you, um, who allow us to range far and wide um, across the fields of economics, finance, science, technology, and other things that take our interest. Uh, we really are grateful for them for their support. Um, you'll know me, I hope, I'm Mike Wardle, I'm CEO here at CN Group. Um, and my job today is to chair the session and really to get out of the way as soon as possible so we can hear from, from Andy. Um, so the agenda today, very simply, a brief introduction from me to the session. Uh, we'll have a 20 minute or so keynote presentation from um, Andy and then plenty of time for Q&A. Um, for those of you who haven't used the GoToWebinar system before, the way to ask a question, which you can do at any point during the session, uh, is to find the question tab on the, dashboard, the GoToWebinar dashboard, uh, type in your question, uh, and that will be fed through to us um, so that we can deal with those. And at any point during the session, please do uh, use that function. Uh, the session's being recorded today, um, so that if you want to go back and listen again, or you have friends and colleagues that you think might be interested, uh, the recording will be available and will be up on our site in a couple of days. Um, <clears throat> just to say that if you do ask a question, uh, we will uh, pass on your contact details to Andy after the session. So as if any need for further follow up and discussion uh, and debate, uh, that, that can take place. Um, I think that's all by way of the, um, you know, the housekeeping. Um, so it's a really great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Andy Wells from Universal Defence and Security Solutions. Um, Andy describes himself as a geographer from birth, and we've just been talking about uh, the fact that making a career out of geography isn't always easy. Um, a, real, a real sense of expertise in geo-intelligence mapping uh, and remote sensing in a variety of business and commercial and security uh, matters. Um, so really looking forward to hearing uh, from Andy today and finding out a little bit more um, about this world. So, Andy, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, as said, my name is Dr. Andy Wells. I'm just going to share my screen so we can hopefully all see the presentation. Um, for the next sort of 20 minutes or so, um, what I'd like to do is just take a peek at the emergence of remote sensing as a perhaps as a mainstream intelligence source. Um, it is fair to say remote sensing, the use of satellite imagery and Earth observation to monitor various things on the Earth's surface has been around since the 1950s, 60s, etc. Coming on really on stream from a commercial perspective into the 1970s and 80s. Um, but before I start and, and, and look at uh, they sort of what we're going to go through for the talk. There are four main elements that I'd like to cover. One is the availability of data, a little look at the spatial resolution, what you can physically see on the Earth's surface, a bit around the, the spectral characteristics uh, and the reflectance of various objects, uh, but actually the mainstays around the value, the so what uh, as a question. And um, I mentioned sort of satellite imagery has been around a little while, but for most commercial purposes, um, actually, if you have dabbled in this area in the sort of 70s and 80s, even into the early 90s, um, chances are you may have got an image that looks a bit like this. Um, there weren't many resources. There were very few satellites uh, uh, around and about. There were even less that were commercially available. Uh, and so for many, it was incredibly difficult to get an image on a regular basis. There were quite a number of technical difficulties. There were problems with some of the images, et cetera. And because the sort of number of satellites was so sparse, chances are if you took a target, and in this case, I'm showing Manchester in the UK, and you said, great, I have a project in Manchester. So I'd like to get an image, please. So you go online and you probably got something that looked a little like that. Um, this is a, a real example, uh, having worked for one of the largest satellite companies. Um, we actually were tasked with creating in the sort of early 2000s, a single cloud free image of the UK. Uh, we managed all but Manchester in a year and a half. 
and it took us a further three and a half years to actually capture one single cloud-free image for, for the Manchester area. And that was the real problem, because whilst a lot of companies were looking at remote sensing and seeing the value and doing great pilots and, and sort of one-off project work, uh, actually trying to do anything operational where you're monitoring a site on a regular basis uh, actually was incredibly difficult because you had huge periods of time where there was no data and therefore no analytics, no intelligence. And then you may get an image three months later, be able to do something. But for, for most operational requirements, that just wasn't viable, to be honest. Um, but things have started to change. So this is uh, MVSAT. Uh, this was launched uh, about sort of 20 to 30 years or so ago. And the first major change is when you compare this, uh, which is about the size of a, a double-decker bus, uh, to the launches of satellites for Earth observation in uh, the recent sort of three, four, five, six years or so. Uh, this example comes from Planet and is, is uh, sort of a, a collection of what they call their dubs. Uh, with each satellite being yeah, roughly the size of a shoebox. That has two major implications. One is cost, cost of build, uh, but equally important is cost of launch, whereas what you needed to launch MVSAT-1 was a rather large rocket and you could launch one satellite at once. Of course, with satellites of this size, you can launch 20, 30, or even 40 satellites in one go. And this has really led to an explosion in terms of the number of objects currently launched into space. So you can see from the sort of 1960s all the way through to the sort of 2015 or so, the actual number of launches globally stayed reasonably steady. However, in the last sort of five, six, seven years or so, it's absolutely exploded. Now, one thing to bear in mind is that not all of these launches of objects are satellites that monitor the Earth using Earth observation. Um, of course, if you look at things like Starlink and Elon Musk, he is launching, you know, hundreds of satellites on a regular basis, which is really driving some of the pattern that you're seeing here and certainly the growth in launches from, uh, from the US. However, sat within here is a huge number of additional Earth observation satellites being launched and therefore starting to address the issue of data availability. And in fact, it doesn't stop there. And um, I put this slide up. Um, from my perspective, I don't expect you to actually be able to read any of the text, but I got it from a website that maps out launches over the next five years or so. And these are each a constellation of launchers that have requested permission. So they may not launch in the end, but they have indicated their interest to do so. And this is being fueled now by a large investment coming from the private sector. So space is being seen as a viable opportunity for a financial return. And that again is fueling the interest in new technologies, more satellites, uh, higher resolution, more availability, easier to access, easier to analyze, which is really only going to drive the market in one direction in terms of a tsunami of data, which then allows you to undertake the processing to, uh, to create business intelligence. And it's not just data availability, because historically, remote sensing and satellite data was seen as a very technical uh, sort of area. You needed specialist software. You needed trained remote sensors. Those people needed to work their way through really quite unfriendly catalogs in order to find the image they want, then download it in a certain way, then pre-process it in order to see a sensible image before you even got to the point of starting to analyze it and, and generate intelligence. That's no longer the case. And I've, I've put up four examples here top left, uh, Amazon Web Services. They are making and have made available now for a number of years, a vast collection of Sentinel-2 data. That is free satellite imagery from uh, the European Space Agency. The resolution's not so good, but the magic word is free. 
and it's also free to use, free to download, free to process. And anything you extract from the imagery is copyright free as well. So it becomes an incredibly valuable for resource to cover large area monitoring. The example on the, the top right is Black Sky. Black Sky, like others, now provide tasking direct to certain clients. So you, from your laptop, if you so wish, and you're, you're willing to pay for the service, you can actually designate an area and request the satellite to task directly to try and capture that area on its next overpass, rather than waiting for uh, uh, whatever data may come into the catalog. Bottom left, uh, a company called Maxar, there's an example where they have quite a wide range of streaming services, APIs, web interfaces, all of which in effect allow you access to the data, driving it straight into other business systems that you're already operating. And the example on the right hand side, the, the planet, um, they're one company, there are plenty of others, who now have moved away from, you have to buy a whole image which was always a blocker for a cost perspective. Now, they'll allow you to buy just a small area. In fact, just the area that your building is in or the two square kilometers of the port and only pay for the data that you use. And again, this is together with the access, together with the data availability, has really broken down many of the barriers to use that we've, we've struggled with over the last 10, 20, sort of 30 years or so. So let's have a look at the resolution, if you like. And again, this is a really simple example just to get context over what you can and cannot see using red, green, blue, the, the wavelengths that your eye uses. So top left is 30 meter resolution. Uh, top right, you're now down to about 10 meter resolution. At about five meter resolution, and this is the diamond light source, by the way, which is uh, uh, sited in Harwell in Oxfordshire on the, the science campus. But at this point, you are starting to see detail of fields. You could well guess that there's forestry there. You're starting to see individual buildings, et cetera. And then down at sort of half a meter resolution, and current resolutions from space are about 30 to 40 centimeter, at least in sort of black and white you're now starting to see a sort of a really quite high level of detail and your eye is starting to discriminate certain targets which machines and systems can also do. So that gives you an, a, an idea on the, the resolution side. If we now look at uh, spectral uh, uh, aspects, our eye sees in sort of red, green, blue light. But as many of you will know, there's an electromagnetic spectrum and the wavelength of light varies from very long to very short. So there are other wavelengths that are emitted or reflected from the Earth's surface, near infrared, mid infrared, thermal, etc. One of the big advantages of satellites are that they can see in these other wavelengths. And they can see things that you can't. And a simple example is when plants photosynthesize and when they're happy and they're growing, they actually throw off near infrared as a byproduct. Um, and the satellites can pick that up and start to understand and see whether a particular crop is healthy or not, or within a field, whether one part of the field is growing well, but a, another part is not. And, and just to give you a few examples of, of, of captured data, again, just to get you context and start to understand what you can and cannot see. Top left, bottom right from Maxar and Satellogic, those are really at the high resolution end where you're starting to discriminate individual buildings, individual vehicles. In the case of planes, you can see actual cargo containers, etc. Top right, uh, is an example where they're using that near infrared and all the fields that you see as bright red are photosynthesizing. They're actually growing and they're developing, whereas the ones that are in sort of blue and lighter colors, nothing is currently planted uh, and there are actually no vegetated or cropping occurring. 
The final example, bottom right, is, is actually taken at night. Uh, so this is actually using radar uh, satellite data. So this is an active sensor, in effect, pinging the Earth's surface, getting a response back and measuring that response. And radar, because of the wavelength, has distinct advantages, two parts. One is it can see at night. And number two, it can see pretty much through cloud, depending on the wavelength you use. It also rather likes metal objects and physical objects, sort of man-made objects, um, that <clears throat> reflect far more strongly than, say, vegetated surfaces. And again, that starts to allow you to do analytics interpretation and, and processing. But you have to ask the question, so what? There is a huge amount of data now available. There is cloud-based processing, there is machine learning, there is artificial intelligence. And it's really the combination of all of those that starts to consider what value can you get out of a satellite image to answer a, a business problem. So what I thought I'd do is I'd just give you a few examples broadly within the finance environment, again, to sort of spark the neurons, start to get an understanding of what might be possible. And then you as, a, as an audience can start to decide whether you need to engage with satellite data a little bit more than you are doing at the moment. So we'll start with one example, which is sort of the commodity side. Uh, and all of the examples I'm going to give, bar the ones I specifically say, are examples of operational services. They're not R&D. So in this case, this is monitoring uh, oil storage facilities um, using satellite data to try and get indications of the total amount of crude oil or processed oil stored at any one particular site globally. Remote sensing can offer quite a good indication of that, although for certain very high value sites, such as the inset image, actually a number of companies use regular drone data to support the remote sensing. And I'll, I'll come back to that point in a moment about using satellite data on its own versus integrating it with other, other sources of intelligence. Uh, on the right hand side, similar thing, but in this case, it's actually using radar data to pick up the response of, of iron ore uh, to look at storage, large areas of, of raw material iron ore or processed iron ore in and around ports or in our mining areas, from which theoretically using other types of satellite data, you can start to get volumetrics and start to understand the outputs from a particular mine or the physical amount of raw material stored at any one particular port ready for shipping. Bottom left, this was a pilot. So this, this example here was done on drone, but is now transferred to uh, uh, satellite data. This is physical counting of palm trees. So the aim is to identify and understand the object. That's what's on the left. On the right, the machine learning identifies what in effect is the center of each individual tree and then uses that to calculate the total number of trees per hectare and therefore the likely output from that particular palm area uh, in the coming year or so. And then another area on the sort of general agriculture side, which has been around for, for quite a number of years, uh, is things like uh, 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 wheat prediction uh, or other crop prediction in terms of uh, likely yield. Uh, and that's undertaken by taking images throughout the growing season, analyzing them and cross comparing them with historical data in order to get an indication of what the likely yield is going to be on a per field or across a whole farm, or even in some cases across a region uh, or a country. Changing tax slightly, um, again, these are just simple examples to get the mind working. But well, this is around examples of economic activity. Uh, on the left, this is some work uh, done in partnership between the Catapult and CGFI. And they were looking to identify particular assets on the ground. Uh, in this case, it was brickworks. And then using satellite data and either visual interpretation or machine learning slash artificial intelligence to identify the object as a brick kiln automatically as we know, brick kilns do produce quite a lot of emissions, 
and the mapping of them globally is actually quite poor. So things like brick kilns, steelworks, or other industrial activity using remote sensing to identify A, how what it is, B, how big it is, C, whether it's active or not, and then you can start to use that to build up intelligence on likely emission databases or likely economic activity. The one on the right, slightly different, this was done for a, a large retailer in the US who wanted to get intelligence on how busy their competition was. So they used remote sensing to do car counting in car parks. And that was then delivered in effect through a web interface, which is what you can see on the screen here. So rather than this sort of large retailer having to deal with satellite data itself, all they got was the intelligence they needed to get an understanding of how their competition was, was doing. If we move to insurance, uh, this is one example. There are actually quite a number uh, of examples of use of remote sensing within the sort of insurance sector. But in this case, this is cat response. So uh, catastrophic event, in this case, storm damage. Um, clearly, there is a time lag. You need to, if you're using optical data as this example is, you need to wait till it's not cloudy. Although integration of drone-based data can help sort of speed that process up, which is what a, a number of insurers are doing. But in this case, you're using machine learning to do automatic identification of roof damage on a per property basis. And then this particular system ties the percentage of roof damage to a database. It then attaches an address. And then in partnership with the insurer, it writes that intelligence to the insurer's book on a property by property basis to give that insurer or reinsurer some likely footprint of which buildings are likely to be damaged, how badly they're damaged, how much it may cost them, or where they may need to send ground resources in to do things like a, an assessment. If we look at the built environment, um, Again, live program, uh, this is looking at solar potential. Uh, there is now national mapping in the UK and there's plans to start going uh, uh, across Europe and, and, and farther afield of the solar potential of every single uh, land plot uh, across the whole of the UK. And similarly, uh, for every single building. So this uses a mixture of data. There is some remote sensing in there, but it also uses things like slope angle, aspect, nearest connection point, current utilization of the, the landscape with net worth agriculture or arable, for example. Um, things like the physical area, whether there is a road next to it, if you need to get vehicles on to actually develop the site, etc. So rather than remote sensing being used on its own, better integrated with other data sets, and that allows you then to get in effect sort of kilowatt hours as a marker on a per property or per land parcel basis for a particular site you're interested in. And um, a little peek into the future, this is sort of imminent technology, which is high resolution thermal. So satellite view uh, have now been around for a few years. Um, I think they've launched or they're planning to launch fairly soon, uh, but that will give you about three meter resolution thermal data to look at emissivity of roofs or for other targets that have a heat differential to the area around them. And if you really wanna go pedantic, and there is a reason for this, then there's actually been projects uh, looking at an urban area and the inset down the bottom is starting to identify properties with front gardens that are still grassed. As we're all aware, there are an increasing number of cars on our road uh, and therefore, people are paving over their front gardens, causing huge difficulty for urban flooding. So starting to get higher intelligence on the total area of porous sur surface within a city becomes ever increasingly important. And then we move on to climate. So climate, as you're well aware, is a, is a fairly impending need. For examples, top left, looking at remote sensing tomorrow, to monitor atmospherics and air quality. Top right, uh, actually monitoring uh, methane emissions, uh, in this case across an oil field. 
bottom left, looking at environmental damage caused by seepage from tailings dams associated with mining. And bottom right, uh, actually looking at particulates in the air and dust effects around construction and mining activity. All of these are now live monitoring capabilities using remote sensing. Uh, and for those looking at the sort of investment market and the voluntary carbon offsets, this again has started to emerge as a viable uh, approach for remote sensing. In this case, using remote sensing to identify uh, damaged peat bogs, uh, which actually are emitters of CO2. And then the inset bottom right is using radar data to measure millimetric changes in the surface of a peat bog. So when you restore it, it starts to fill with water and physically grows in height, measuring that down to circa about a millimeter and using that to actually calculate the tons of CO2 estimate captured which allows you then to sort of monitor, report on and verify any carbon credits that are associated with that development. Um, I'm running out of time a little bit. So I put two slides in about who we are, Universal Defence. Um, one is we, we are the, the largest pool of former UK military staff in the UK. Uh, and, and our role here is we, we collect that sort of defense, security, intelligence, geospatial intelligence experience. And we partner with British industry to provide solutions on defense and security, but we also increasingly now do it for, for commercial activity, finding the right capability in partners, building a solution that meets the needs, and then using our experts within the team to make sure that our solution is delivered on time to specification and meet the actual client need that's required. I put a couple of characters in. Uh, they will be part of the deck that's provided, so I will not go through them now, but it gives you a flavor of the, the types of individuals within the team. And basically, I'll leave you with one thought then before we go to Q&A. Um, I entitled this tongue in cheek, everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, that's a bit of a lie, right? So. If I were to say that remote sensing can see everything you want, everywhere you want to see it, and all at the same time, that's not the case. Weather and cloud is still a major issue. Not as much as it used to. When you only had one overpass of a satellite every five days, it was a challenge. Now, for various parts of the Earth, you're getting 15 overpasses every day from different satellites. So the likelihood of seeing what you want to see is much, much higher. But what I would ask you to be is be curious. If you've got business challenges, issues, you're wondering if remote sensing can enhance your current uh, knowledge about the landscape, what is occurring, what has happened previously, then ask. Because if you don't ask, you will never know. And, and what we pride ourselves in is often saying, no, you can't as much as yes, you can. And on that note, I'll say thank you very much for your attention, uh, hand back, and hopefully there'll be a, a few questions. Well, thank you very much indeed, Andy, for that overview. Um, I guess a, a question for me is um, a lot of people are staking a lot on sort of climate measure, you know, remote sensing as a measure of climate action. Um, can you give us a sense of examples where it is useful? I mean, you've given us the one of um, peat bogs and areas where it's not useful. In other words, you know, where you have to find other ways to, to measure progress. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, a, a good question. So, well, let's stick with the peat bog, shall we? So um, the peatland cold is quite clear at the moment. You know, you're looking at ground-based measurement. You need people to go on the ground to do all your measurements, etc. But remote sensing now is getting to a point where it's being recognized as a viable alternative. Uh, and that makes it much more cost effective and much more regular. Whereas you always had to estimate your amount of CO2 uh, sequestrated and therefore you were estimating the value of the credit and you always had to underestimate. If you can get a more accurate, more regular measure, you're likely to get an earlier return and it's likely to be much clearer. And for peat bogs, because of the nature of the landscape, 
remote sensing offers a really viable solution. However, let's say you're actually your, your carbon offsets are in forestry. Now, forestry is good with remote sensing. It can tell your trees are there or your trees aren't. Um, species delineation is getting there, but it's not quite there yet. So it will give you a good answer, but not a great answer. So you need to be aware of that. But now cross compare it with, say, mangrove, which again is a brilliant carbon sequestration. However, a lot of sequestration is actually under the water and remote sensing doesn't stand a chance. So getting TCO2, tons of CO2 estimate out of a mangrove environment is much more difficult using remote sensing alone. And therefore you really are gonna be a bit more reliant on ground-based data, maybe some drone and seagrass. Another great example, brilliant if it's in the Caribbean, I can help you, bloody awful if you're in the North Sea off uh, Teesside, where you know turbidity of the water means you're not really getting to see much from uh, much from space. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, <clears throat> we have murky waters around the around the UK. Uh, not helpful. Um, just uh, thinking about sort of you know looking at oceans um, and really you know do you have a sense of what the uses are of remote image sensing in the study of ocean and ocean change? I mean, obviously there's temperature measurement. Which uh, one thing, but you know, where else is it useful for, for ocean monitoring? Yeah, um, well, so if we look at the, I've got a couple of examples. It's not, maritime is not my area of expertise per se, but uh, a couple of examples. If we look at the, the natural side, there's been some work started to be done on plastics identification on the, uh, on the ocean surface, uh, and then starting to identify areas where it's collecting due to currents and therefore targeting any remedial activity in areas where it, you know, it's going to have the, the most impact. You've mentioned sea surface temperatures. Those have been measured for many, many years using remote sensing. And there are brilliant databases uh, within the UK, within uh, the likes of the Natural Environmental Research Council uh, uh, and other organisations within that team. Um, in terms of the sort of literal sort of land sea interface, you know, I, I'd mentioned things like the sort of mangrove side, uh, and there's been some great programs doing things like early warning of oil spill detection, using radar data to identify an oil spill, uh, current and wind information to, to analyze where it might go, and then immediate alerts sent to the local authorities who can basically send out uh, dispersal boats and interdict before the oil spill actually hits the coastline, therefore damaging both uh, the natural uh, environment or things like tourism, uh, uh, aquaculture, etc. cetera. Um, the final element, which is getting quite a lot of attention is, is the sort of shipping and ports. So there are some excellent examples of things like ship identification, illegal fishing activity, uh, where your ship is, where your ship is not, finding missing ships, uh, port management for things like CO2 emission, uh, particulates such as nitrogen and sulfur emissions, which have a, an issue with air quality. Those are some good examples of actually where remote sensing is starting to make some quite serious steps forward. Okay, um, Frank Miller has asked about the monitoring rates for deforestation and just asking what sort of combination of satellite and other imagery would you need to use to monitor changes in woody biomass? I mean, that's the... Oh, right. right. Um, so physical area, let, let's sort of break it down, if you like. So there's sort of three variables, basically. How big an area are you growing? How tall is it? Yeah, and, and what is growing physically? What sort of species, if you like? In, in terms of area, that's pretty well covered. Depending where you are in the world, a mixture of either optical, red, green, blue uh, uh, data, into near infrared and mid infrared data will allow you to get the aerial extent. For cloudy areas, radar data is a great option because it's far less attenuated by, uh, by cloud. So, so area and monitoring changes, deforestation and reforestation, I, I think you've got a great chance and there are some excellent programs 
and companies already out there doing that sort of work. For the height of the forest, there are various techniques, high net worth, you can use airborne laser, or you can use drone-based data to generate 3D models uh, of your entire canopy, but it's not cheap. So for larger areas, you can use uh, stereo satellite data, and, and that is feasible. Uh, there are one or two other techniques that you can use. And so therefore, the sort of volume, if you you've got some chance of doing it, uh, especially if you integrate a couple of technologies to do it, or you happen to have people on the ground, especially in things like reforestation programs. The actual species type, now that's where it gets a bit more difficult. Broad-based delineation, deciduous versus coniferous, actually you've got a fair fighting chance. Looking at the difference between oak and ash is starting to get much more difficult. There has been steps forward, and I have to say things like machine learning and moving into AI is helping enormously, as are the raft of training data pouring into those buckets. So it's starting to come online and there are some companies starting to provide certain solutions. But personally, I still think it's got a little way to go. At University of Leicester, shout out to them. They've got some excellent experts on uh, forestry. Thank you. So, uh, Frank, Frank, you might want to follow that up also with the University of Leicester um, if, if that's particularly interested. Uh, Bob Webb's asked, um, you know, given the increasingly you know, high resolution and unlimited access to data, you know, are there legal and privacy risks that you know, we are facing and need, need to face face up to? Um, yes. Well, well, the legal side of space is um, growing very quickly. So um, space has become a really interesting place, in effect, for various countries around the globe. And legalities over launch, orbits, what you can see, what you can't see, uh, who can get access to what data uh, and why, uh, is all starting to come to the fore really strongly. Now, at the moment, there are, if you wish to buy an image of a particular site across the globe, there are really very few limitations if you're accessing commercial data at this second in time. Um, if the resolution gets any higher, are there likely to be limits? Quite possibly. And are there legal implications or are there challenges with access to the data? Yes, there are. And, you know, I, I, I can give you a simple example is if you look at a single image of a particular country, which is has challenges with uh, warring factions. An image can be bought by the, the FCDO, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, uh, and used to analyze uh, migration of refugees where support is required, challenges of borders, uh, food security, changes in agriculture and markets, etc. And they are all valuable and positive things, allowing the UK and its partners globally to try and support peoples that are under stress and in difficulty. Somebody else could buy the same image of the same people and the same activity, but for a very different purpose. And they can buy it. There are limitations. There are certain countries cannot access certain types of data. But as there becomes more data and more actors are in in this place, then policing, legals and, and how we handle this is going to get ever more difficult. So for any lawyers out there, it's a growth business um, for the moment. Um, <coughs> we've got another question from um, uh, Professor Lynch. Um, asking whether the cost of imagery is continuing to fall and if that's likely to be a continuing trend. Yes, yes and yes. Um, there will be a bottom to the market, there always is, because, you know, you, you can't empty costs out of a, of a process to, to zero. Um, however, you are quite right, the costs of imagery have dramatically fallen. And the reason being is that, turn the clock back, the main people who were willing to pay for a satellite and get access to it were governments, either on the defence side 
or on the civilian side. And you're talking about large beasts, expensive to build, expensive to launch, expensive to maintain. Therefore, the imagery was expensive. Of course, there were those who booked that trend, the Landsat series from the US, brilliant, absolutely fantastic, free to use for now, God, 20, 30, 40 years, I, I don't actually know, but a very long period of time. The moment that you start to get increasing competition and launches from multiple different companies, and those companies were not linked to governments and they weren't governments, they were commercial bodies. And the moment they started to make money is the moment the finance markets woke up and started investing in them, which fired the circle again. So at this moment, you can still pay many thousands of pounds per image. If you want very high resolution, tasked over a certain area, closest to a certain length of time. However, if you don't, and you want, say, three meter resolution of your house, and you had the right relationship or agreement with the provider, then you, out of archive, you may be talking about 10 pounds mm. for one square kilometer. Now, now that, that makes it quite interesting for ongoing monitoring purposes at that sort of price, together with machine learning, which is removing the sort of manual work or still further, you're starting to get a, a, an interesting proposition. Final point, there are more actors coming into the marketplace. There are more launchers. So, yes, I do expect pricing to continue to tumble. Thank you. Um, and so if you had your crystal ball with you, um, and you want to look into the future, where, where do you think the, the next development is going to go in terms of remote sensing? What's the, you know, what are people thinking about, which isn't yet, isn't yet delivered, but, but where might it go? Um, so I am, <laughs> right, so I love remote sensing. I use it operationally. I'm in some more application rather than technical specialist. Uh, and clearly understanding what's coming down the line helps the the sort of, the applications of tomorrow, if you like. I do try and keep up with technology, but please don't take the next 30 seconds or so as rote, right? Because I keep falling behind because things are moving too damn quickly. Um, number one, there are a raft of satellites just launched, going to be launched, starting to be developed all around greenhouse gas emissions. So looking at far better monitoring of heavy particulates, methane, but now moving into CO2. So actually, can we start monitoring remotely CO2 emissions? And that would give us a much better footprint on where they're coming from and, and what to do to mitigate them. So I think there's a raft of atmospheric type satellites going to go up, which will drive the science and drive the applications there very strongly hyperspectral. So I mentioned red, green, blue as the three wavelengths of light we see. Near those, there's near-infrared, mid-infrared. A really good satellite, uh, God, well, maybe 10 or 11 different wavelengths. And, and everything on the Earth's surface has a reflectance curve across, say, a thousand wavelengths. And you're looking at just 10 of them, basically. Hyperspectral is going to be looking at 100 or 150 or 200 and 250. Using that spectral response, your chance to identify a specific target and understand what it is goes up through the roof. Yep. So I have a feeling that is also going to be uh, a next generation thing. And finally, the speed, I think. So if we're thinking about in orbit, they are now looking at in orbit processing. So satellite A takes an image passes it to satellite B who processes the image and only sends the results back, which might be a tiny little area going, you've got a problem and it's here. If that chain starts developing, the pace and the cost again will, 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 will go down. Thank you very much. Um, we have a, a short poll um, for the audience, just as a, a finishing off. Um, and so if we could launch the poll, um, just asking, um, you know, g g given the discussion we've had, uh, which of these options is, is more relevant to your work? Satellite imagery remains unlikely to offer value. It may offer some benefit and you can see the potential for significant additional value. So do 
to vote. Just waiting for the results to come in. And uh, if we can show the results, please. Um, well, there you go. 81% uh, <laughs> be the potential for significant additional value. So I think, Andy, you've persuaded the audience. Um, there's something here which they need to be looking into, need to be investigating. Um, so thank you very much for, for that contribution. Um, we've reached the end of our time, I'm afraid. Um, we could have gone on, I'm sure, for, for longer. Um, but I'd just like to finish again by uh, thanking our sponsors. Again, they help us run this webinar series and to uh, keep information flowing uh, between our communities. Um, and finally, we've got some uh, interesting events uh, on the stocks um, on Monday the 21st. Uh, helping unlock finance for SMEs in the race to zero. On the 23rd of August, financing for steel sector decarbonisation. So a real focus there on um, you know, carbon and uh, climate. And on the 29th of August, authorised push payments, uh, just updating us on uh, with, you know, the latest developments. Do keep an eye on the website for future events. Um, but by way of thanks, Andy, normally on a uh, real life event, I could throw this open for a round of applause. I can't do that today, but the thanks uh, of myself and the audience are genuine nonetheless. Um, it's been fascinating. Uh, thank you so much for your time. My pleasure.